Today is Wednesday, November 11, 2020, coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered. As the Supreme Court hears arguments in the case of where the Trump folks want to get rid of the, the Affordable Care Act, Care Act, coronavirus cases surge all across the country. Texas passes one million. We will talk about the politics and the pandemic. Donald Trump continues to battle to hold on to office. Y'all, he's lost. Don, but Joe Biden increases his lead uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and look, uh, Georgia announces they're going to go to a hand recount. He'll still lose. And today we celebrate Veterans Day and look at the military support for President-elect Joe Biden. We'll also talk about the importance of the Georgia runoffs coming up in January. And in our tech segment, we'll talk with Isaac Hayes III about his fan base app. And we remember... Lucille Bridges, the mother of Ruby Bridges. Folks, it is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the find. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Coronavirus continues to ravage the nation. Texas passes 1 million cases. Folks, here are the total number. 10.4 million cases uh, across the country. Uh, that is, uh, cases reported in all 50 states, 241 thousand people uh, have died as a result of coronavirus. Uh, it is uh, still uh, a, a huge, huge issue in this country. And in spite of the continued spread of the deadly disease, the Supreme Court is hearing arguments uh, to end the Affordable Care Act. 23 million people have health insurance as a result of the Affordable Care Act, which is critically important, of course, during this pandemic. President-elect Joe Biden has made it clear that health care is a top priority for his administration. In order to manage our health care crisis, though, we need to address a number of issues that affect health outcomes, particularly in underserved communities and especially African-Americans. Joining us now is attorney Daniel Dawes, who was instrumental in shaping the Affordable Care Act. His latest book is called The Political Determinants of Health. Glad to have you uh, on the show, Daniel. This is, um, this, this is uh, again, a, a major issue. Before we talked about uh, your previous book that dealt with 150 years of uh, the Affordable Care Act, if you will, the battle that took place just constantly in this country uh, when it came to health care. And, and, and Donald Trump has no plan. Republicans have no plan. And, you know, we saw on the, on the, on the stump, these Senate candidates, uh, John James in, in Michigan, uh, no plan. Uh, and all they can do is criticize the Affordable Care Act. Uh, they talked about, oh, how it was a fail massive failure and we're running it better. Well, it's kind of hard to call it a failure if you're so-called running it better, which means that it actually served a purpose. And so this still is a contentious issue. And for some reason... Uh, Republicans uh, just don't want to acknowledge the reality that this is important to the American people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Roland. Of course, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And um, let me just uh, start by saying that we know that over the last 10 years that this law has been hanging in the balance. But this third case before the Supreme Court is the one that is pushing it to its closest brush with death. So let's put it in perspective, right? We know that the uninsured rate for African Americans under the ACA has declined by 50%, right? We know that's true for whites as well, even though they may deny that. But it is true that we have seen the uninsurance rate drop significantly. When Obama was leaving office, the nation's uninsured rate actually dropped for the first time to its lowest level at 8.6% at the end of 2016. Then when Trump became president, we saw that number starting to creep up. Again, 8.7% in 2017, 8.9% the next year, and then at 9.2% in 2019. Is it any wonder? And yet, as you mentioned, 
we're in this triple pandemic, right, of COVID-19, this racial and social reckoning that we're going through with high rates of disparities that for the first time, many people are actually getting to see now, right, for what we were talking about, as you mentioned in previous episodes, talking about health inequities in America. So there is a lot to unfold, and I'm looking forward to having that discussion with you. The thing that, when we talk about those numbers, uh, Donald Trump yeah. loves to tout uh, how great he is being for the blacks, uh, but they don't seem to bring up this number. They don't seem to bring up which number? Uh, in terms of the, the numbers you just cited. Right, they don't. And and let me tell you, that is quite upsetting. They don't even tell you about the uh, fact that uh, we've lost, what, half a million people per year uh, since he became president have lost health insurance coverage. He hasn't talked about how they've been undermining the Affordable Care Act administratively, right? So let's put the issue of the ACA case uh, that we are currently talking about. Let's put it on the side for a minute. But administratively, we know that his administration has been defunding the navigators, the assisters, and other programs that were intended to increase uh, coverage and enrollment in our community, right? They don't talk about the fact that they used lots of that money to run negative ads about the Affordable Care Act, again, to undermine the law. So there are a lot of things that have happened administratively that um, we should be taking notice of as well. So, um, so we have this case, and so obviously we'll wait to see what the Supreme Court uh, decides. Uh, but um, what then happens, what changes with a Joe Biden being in the White House? Sure. So I think what you're going to see is um, Joe Biden pressing that rewind button on the Trump administration's health policies. And then you will see an unwinding of many of those regulations, uh, many of those sub-regulations and executive orders that um, President Trump had uh, signed. And um, what this means is that you're going to see this unwinding of policies around the Affordable Care Act, right? Uh, we could talk about that quickly if we have time. We know that also with the Medicaid program, we will see some unwinding there. Same thing with reproductive health. Uh, drug pricing is going to be another issue, along with many of the health equity provisions that were included um, and that were bolstered by the Obama administration. So I think you're going to see a lot of that happening. You know, the, the truth be told, the Trump administration has actually been working over time to undermine any of the health policies that were intended over the last 40 years, in fact, intended to bolster health equity. Policies that I know many of your viewers, um, you know, have been working diligently on a bipartisan basis to get implemented. But the Trump administration is the first administration that has been very strategic, very deliberate in undermining those uh, health disparities. And in fact, even the HHS strategic plan, the Department of Health and Human Services strategic plan, which had long enjoyed um, the prioritization of health equity or the reduction or elimination of health disparities, that is no longer a priority under this administration. I think Biden, as we all know, is taking a very robust health equity lens to the work. And I think what we will see uh, is greater investments than even under the Obama administration. From what we can tell, you'll see greater investments in this effort to advance health equity for all groups. Um, and, and that particular point, uh, again, this is what people have to understand. With Biden being in the White House, this has nothing to do with Congress, nothing to do with whatever they decide uh, until the Supreme Court rules, if they rule to affirm the Affordable Care Act. Uh, again, they will control the levers of power and now go back to aggressive recruitment uh, uh, and trying to uh, help folks when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. That's right. So I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, priorities that... Um, uh, VP Biden had in mind um, the public option being one of those, which I'm still hopeful that it is a very popular health policy. But essentially what the VP wants to do with that, and I'm a little nervous about uh, the turn of events then relative to the Senate, because if he doesn't get that majority, it's going to be a little more difficult unless he can pull off uh, some of the more moderate uh, Republican senators. But this public option, right, intended to... Um, uh, increase uh, individuals who are between 60 and 65, allow them to access uh, Medicare, right? There, are, there was also an attempt for those who fall in that gap. Uh, they live in states that haven't expanded Medicaid. Uh, they live in states where they cannot afford 
the um, premiums in the health insurance exchange. Uh, VP Biden wanted to uh, open those up as, as part of his public option policy priority. So that, I'm afraid, may be challenging uh, depending on the outcome of the Senate. All right, then, uh, Daniel Dawes. We certainly appreciate it, man. Thank you so very much. Again, folks, uh, please pull up the book. Uh, his new book is called The Political Determinants of Health. That's, uh, of course, that's uh, critically important uh, when we talk about what's happening with us and how we have been negatively impacted by coronavirus. Daniel Dawes, thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. Appreciate it. All right, I want to bring in my panel right now. A. Scott Bolden, former chair, National Bar Association Political Action Committee. Robert Patillo, executive director of the uh, Rainbow Push Coalition Peach Tree Street Project. Also, Rena Shaw, she is uh, the uh, with the Lincoln Project Women's Coalition. I'll start with uh, you on this one, Rena. When we talk about the Affordable Care Act, we talk about, of course, um, how vital it has been. Republicans have been uh, yelling, screaming, uh, and crowing about it, have not offered any real substantive plan. The thing that is still crazy, as you, as you talk to folks about this, who, see, who somehow can't seem to understand what it really means when people don't have health care. When you look at Medicaid expansion across various states uh, in this country, uh, how in red states they have voted against the Republicans to expand a Medicaid because people understand, man, if you don't have health care, you're screwed if you're a family. That's right, Roland. I mean, my viewpoint is far different than most people because I'm married to a physician. I'm the daughter of a physician. I'm the sister of a physician. I live this day in and out. And also in 2008, 2009, I was on Capitol Hill as a junior health legislative assistant for a member of Congress, a Republican. And I got to hear and see what the Republican talking points were on the Affordable Care Act at that time. Now, in my public health education as well, there was not a great focus on what the Affordable Care Act's long-lasting impact would be. It was from the university level, from academia, as always, that this is a good thing for our society. We need more people covered. My first job in Washington was at the National Association of Community Health Centers. And I worked on a website that summer, this was in the year 2006, that was called Save the Safety Net. And so we've always had a safety net. We've always committed to taking care of those Americans who are too sick to care for themselves. But the reality is, in the year 2020, as we live in the middle of this pandemic, some stark realities have come to the forefront. And I think a great many people in my native West Virginia are waking up to that. I'm the co-owner of a clinic there with my family. We offer primary care and family medicine services. I know firsthand what these people are experiencing without access to care. It is a really tough life. Nothing works for you. And I think what we what we know now is that our community health centers, the safety net that we have in this country was simply not enough. So here I am 12 years later sitting in front of you telling you, I think the Affordable Care Act was an excellent thing. At that time, I said, okay, good thing. Pre-existing conditions, that's something we can all agree on. That was the one thing Republicans said, sure, that's, that's something we can agree on. But now I look at this and I see how people in red states like my native West Virginia, like I just said, have benefits so much from just being covered. And there's a lot of data to back this up. Living here in this pandemic right now has exacerbated really the fact that we have so many political impediments, political barriers. And so we can't manage America's health crises without addressing what the political determinants of health really are. And one of the greatest ones is coverage, simply being covered and not worrying that going to an emergency room is going to break you, bankrupt you. And this is what we owe to our fellow Americans. We are in a moment of fundamental debate in this country, which I think is a good thing. Look, I'm not a proponent of Medicare for all because I think we'll fundamentally restructure the American economy. But look, my mind is open to change, like I said. And I just think we have to start somewhere. And that somewhere means that we ought to call out the Republicans for stopping what they've done, just as Attorney Dawes said, administratively chipping away an act that has served so many Americans in rural and urban areas so very well ever since its passage. Um, Robert, this is obviously... Uh, a, a, a huge, a huge, huge issue uh, in this country, and health care shouldn't be a partisan issue. 
Well, you're, you're absolutely correct. And what, what I think people need to think back to think back before Obamacare, the debate around that, and think back to uh, Hillary Care back in the early 90s. The, what Obamacare turned out to be, or as um, Tim Pawlenty called it, Obamacare, it was a version of or closer to the Republican health care plan of 1993 <laughs> okay, than it was to the I universal uh, coverage idea. So uh, so that we are already started at the stopgap measure. That's why Republicans haven't been on the offer an alternative to Obamacare, because the, we are already starting from their alternative. So in this upcoming election in Georgia, that I know we're going to cover later, it's important for people to realize that what is on that ballot on January the 5th uh, is whether or not we will be able to expand the Affordable Care Act, whether we will be able to provide health care coverage to the 10 million people who have been infected with coronavirus, and whether or not insurance companies can use a previous COVID-19 diagnosis as a justification to remove coverage from an individual. So fundamentally in America, we have to rethink how we look at health care. Health care can no longer be considered a luxury item. It is something which is essential for society to function. Uh, when I was a kid, we had what was called DGS insurance, which is don't get sick, because you were not going to the doctor unless you were on death's door. We were not taking you to uh, to a hospital. And when you um, provide medical health care that way, that's death care, because people do not get checked out. They do not get the short-term medical care that they need until it's far too late and they require intensive services. So America can do better, and I think we're in a position where we have to do so. Um, Scott, again, this is when you start looking at these critical issues. Uh, this is one because it impacts every single, every single person in the family. But the other thing that people don't understand is, again, the impact of health care and how it has driven folks into bankruptcy. And, and, and what you have here is you have, okay, you have Republicans who hate it. All right. Like I keep saying, if you hate something, what's your alternative? And the bottom line is, they haven't offered one. They simply haven't. Yeah, yeah Roland, that, it, that's an amazing fact that uh, coupled with the fact that the top 10 poor states in this country are red states. And in those red states, many of them um, uh, of the people who need health care the most who are on under HCA right now, as the Republicans chip away at it, that voting electorate continues to vote for Republicans versus Democrats. And the Republicans only attack Obamacare, but they don't have an alternative plan. It's sheer lunacy. And so um, it not only drives people to bankruptcy if they get a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar bill, but it also drives those same individuals if they don't have any insurance and health care. It, it, it drives them to the emergency rooms for a cold or flu. It drives up hospital costs and then drives up health care costs drives up pharmaceutical costs simply because they don't have a plan and they don't have a doctor. Uh, mostly poor people, or pe pe poor people, people not engaged, and kind of people who are off the radar are attending these hospitals driving the cost up. And so uh, the credibility of the Republican Party, I, I, they, for the sake of America, they need to either have a plan or stop attacking the plan that most of their voters like. Remember, 60 to 70 percent at various times of this country, that statistic approved of the the Health Care Act. They hated Obamacare, but they approved of HCA. The thing that we're seeing, and like look right now with coronavirus, we're seeing right now how uh, it is uh, it is going crazy uh, in El Paso. It is uh, that was, was there was this video I saw yesterday of massive lines in Illinois uh, as they were trying to. Folks were trying to get, trying to in, in their cars, waiting to get tested because Illinois has had more than ten thousand deaths in that state. Uh, and and so, Rena, what, what what's unbelievable is that, and I think the contrast, I think the contrast uh, today is a perfect example between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Uh, today, uh, Joe Biden was actually uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, laying the uh, uh, laying the wreath, and in fact, it, it, he, here's a video here. This is this is Biden and his team going to lay the wreath uh, for Veterans Day in uh, Philadelphia. You see, in the midst of a midst of a pandemic, Joe, Vi Joe Biden with his mask on, Jill Biden with her, with her mask on, all the other individuals around them uh, with their mask on. Rena, you see that now. We're gonna, now we're going to sit here and transition to uh, transition to Donald Trump. This was Trump. Uh, th this is the video here of Trump and all of their folks at Arlington National Cemetery. Y'all. 
It's like, yeah. seriously? I mean, Rena, you're sitting, you, you're watching Trump. You're sitting here watching, uh, you, you're watching Pence. Um, you, you're seeing all, you see, and, and all the, the spouses with him. Nobody's wearing a mask, as if this thing is not real. Mm -hmm. You know, when I see these images rolling, I think to myself, my gosh, these people really think they're better than everyone else. I mean, a mask is not just for oneself. It is about those people around you. And that is the fundamental truth, is that we know public health awareness. It's, I mean, this has been gone on for the entirety of my life, and I'm, I'm only in my mid-30s, but I'll just say, it just sounds completely nonsensical to me that these people wear a mask one, one day, and then the next day, it's sort of, okay, let me just go about my business without. That's a, a, a dis, just, you know, the disconnect, the fundamental disconnect that voters could not see. Those 71 million fellow Americans of mine could not see the visual images that we get all the time in the internet, in the, you know, wherever you look, media of any sort. Even if you're not looking at media that is favorable to your candidate, you are still seeing images of him wearing a mask one day and not another day. And it just doesn't make sense that they deny health science. I got it. They invite in, deny environmental science. The Republican Party has been doing that forever. And, and I think it's uh, the sort of younger generation like myself that I don't hear it as much. And thank God for that, because I, I am not a denier of truth. And when I see fact and I see science, and I, I, I don't deny that because I think we, we've made it this far. Uh, you know, really, we all live to the life expectancy we have these days. Why? Modern science, advancement. In, in health and research, all related to fact and truth. They reject it over and over. But to me, if you can't be a, just a sensible person who looks at these images and thinks to yourself, is it because they think they're better than everyone else? It's like they're operating on another plane. So the good news is that we won't have to take much longer of this. But I look at some of the realities, and I, I, I'm kind of encouraged by what but Scott just said. It was really great, Mr. Bolden. The, the point was, is that how Republicans really rely on the rest of the country. And I read a tweet from Paul Graham, and that was today. And Paul Graham tweeted, though Trump campaigned as the pro-business candidate, Biden won 70 to 29, measured by the productivity of the counties that supported him. And now look, when I read that, I just had one observation, and I wanted to be truthful about it. And I know it's very blunt, but my argument is the GOP represents poor, unproductive people that exist on the federal distributions of Blue America. This is a fundamental truth. They need to wake up to this. We've woken up to it. People like myself who intend to lead the party into the future, we've woken up to that fact. And I, I don't mean to say poor people are always unproductive and unproductive people are always poor, but I've been looking at the GOP for a while and I see a lot of things add up. And it's added up to me that these people are relying on blue states. And so how much more, how much longer do Republican politicians think this charade is going to go on? Well, they here's... Speak for themselves. Robert, here's what's crazy. The, the, the Centers for Disease Control yesterday said mask wearing benefits the person wearing it and then the person who is around them. This is the New York Times story. Watch this here. The agency also offered an economic argument, saying that increasing the proportion of people who wear masks by 15 percent could prevent the need for lockdowns and cut associated losses of up to $1 trillion, or about 5 percent of gross domestic product. So the folks who are bitching and moaning about lockdowns and masks don't realize that if you wear the mask, we won't have to have continued lockdowns. <laughs> well, if, even if you remember back to the original well, guidance from the Coronavirus Task Force, they said that if you are unable to socially distance, then wear a mask. If you're, they explained the droplets, the uh, what happens with the covalent shell, with the lipids, all that stuff was has been out there. And even beyond that, you can just simply look at the nations on Earth where mask wearing is ubiquitous. I went to Japan last year. They were wearing masks before coronavirus even broke out, and they had one of the lowest numbers of fatalities on Earth because they already take public health protocols. You cannot both be ignorant and lazy. 
crazy. And so I think the, the issue with the Trump administration is the reason everyone in that photo didn't have picture or uh, mask on is because they know they will be okay. They're going to get the dextamethasone. They're going to get the rendezvous. They're going to get the monoclonal antibody treatments. They're going to get all kinds of experimental stuff, the super soldier serum from Iron Man, whatever, or from the Captain America, whatever it takes, they will be fine. But what their followers don't understand is when you're sitting somewhere in a trailer park, you are not going to be getting those experimental uh, uh, medications, and you're not going to have the same health care outcomes that Donald Trump and uh, Melania and Mike Pence and everyone else have gotten. Uh, you're going to get that Herman Cain treatment, not the uh, Ben Carson treatment that they're uh, going for. So people have to listen to the medical science. And the reason they try to discredit people like Fauci and everyone else who's in the medical profession is because they under um, they have sold people this bill of goods that simply machismo and American exceptionalism is enough to kill the virus, and that simply does not work. The thing that's a crazy, Scott, is uh, the White House political director tested positive for coronavirus. Secretary of HUD, Ben Carson, his wife, tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, then uh, Peter Alexander tweeted, Trump ally Healy Baumgartner says she tested positive for coronavirus. She was at the White House party on the night of the election. So, so now twice in three months, the White House has been responsible for super spreader events. These people are stupid. There is a reason they should have lost. And this is a perfect example. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, I, I, if you look at some of the uh, media reports, they took a, they, they looked at where these super spreader events, these campaign events for Donald Trump were over the last two or three weeks. And they saw in those counties there was a rise in those counties of COVID-19 um, uh, spreading. Uh, they couldn't tie it directly to those massive events. But it's hard not to if you, if, through race ipsa loquitur, that that was a major contributor to it. But guys, I got to tell you, uh, this is far simpler than the complexities of what I've heard from you uh, and, and, our, and my, my panelists. If, if, you, if you interview the Trump supporters, the average Trump supporters, and you'd ask them about science and COVID-19 and why aren't you wearing a mask, their responses reflect what they're getting from Donald Trump. If you ask the people in the White House and the leaders of the GOP, why they're not wearing a mask, why don't they believe in science? They mimic what Donald Trump is telling them, which sh shows you that leadership from the top and the messaging from the top, right, is and this cult-like belief in Donald Trump is more powerful than we've ever seen before. His followers are just as ignorant as he is. The people he hires are just as ignorant as he is, and they've got COVID-19. He got COVID-19, and his followers are getting COVID-19. It's a real simple equation, and he's the, at the core of it. Donald Trump is at the core of it. And, um, you know, it's funny. Rena, I'm sitting here, and I'm, I'm going through... I, I don't follow him at all. But, but I'm going through the Twitter feed of uh, Donald Trump, and um, Bishop Harry Jackson Jr., who was one of Donald Trump's... Uh, was listed as a spiritual advisor... I think it was on Easter. He, he, he prayed with him. You can see a lot of photos with evangelicals uh, standing behind him. Uh, he died on Monday, okay? Uh, had tested positive for COVID two days previously. But if you want to see how Donald Trump doesn't give a damn about you, I'm looking on here, and maybe I'll find it. I don't even see a tweet acknowledging the death of Bishop Harry Jackson. Donald Trump don't give a damn about none of these people. He don't care about any of his staff members uh, who, um, uh, who, who who gets this. He don't care. And these fools... So let me real clear. You will got to be stuck on stupid if you are going to the White House uh, to be with a man who doesn't care about whether you live or die. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's like they have to be faced with that. It has to be thrown in their face for them to understand. It has to be broken down in such a way. But, you know, I think... I, I, I really heard something here, and I think that was echoed by both my fellow panelists, is that there is just a fundamental disconnect with how they see us. And, uh, you know, when I think about us, I think about black and brown babies like my children and those children, over 600 of them who they cannot locate their parents, the children that were in cages. Lawyers say it's worse than they thought. They cannot locate the parents of these children. It breaks my heart, but it does not break the heart of Donald Trump 
who I unfollowed on Twitter uh, just the other day, by the way, I must say, and I encourage everybody to do so because we have a president elect now. And, uh, you know, look, you got to, you got to smile or laugh about something in this, in this era, because it is just so much worse. And, and, you know, when I, when I talk to some Republicans, they say, well, Obama, he, he built those cages. He put those kids in cages. And then you just, you you think to yourself, okay, now I got to start at point A here. I got to break down for them how it all went down. But the, the reality is, is that the average voter throughout our land is not reading much, is not much connected to any form of news. I mean, they might consume it in the form of fast food headlines here and there, but but the vast majority of Americans are not really plugged up or in the know of kind of what's happening in our nation's capital or in their state houses. And then secondly, they reject it because it's just far too complex for them to listen to. So there's almost a rejection of fact right there. But when I say that black and brown people are adversely impacted by COVID-19, I have data to back that up. I have stats to back that up. And if I go to some Republicans and I say, Herman Cain, Bishop Harry Jackson Jr., these are prominent black people who were near the president and were in his orbit and contracted COVID-19 and are now dead. And the president doesn't care. Why? Because the color of their skin. And that's just what it boils down to, because this country is very racist. I've opened my eyes up to that this past four years. I used to reject this. And look, I'm still not a fan of identity politics and coloring everything and sort of like, okay, I'm Indian American. I used to say when I was growing up, I'm just American. I'm born here. My parents happen to be of Indian ancestry. I'm of Indian ancestry, therefore. But uh, I, I just really think it's time to wake up and see how they see us. Because only then can any sort of progress be made. Otherwise, we're operating from a plane of, okay, I came here thinking something different. I'll give you, for example, and I, I only want to take a second with this real vi- this vignette. The day after the election, I was on air on a foreign outlet uh, opposite some, some guy, Eli Bremer from Colorado. Anybody interested in looking this guy up? He's like a two-time Olympian, former Marine or in the armed forces. And, you know, I, I, since today is Veterans Day, I want to say thank you to all those who served. And I, I respect that. I respect somebody who's put on the uniform for us. But this guy's coming at me hot and heavy because I, in my opening statement, said that I do not accept this president. I do I, I have not liked him. I've, I find him to be ridiculous on many levels. And I sort of backed it up with why and gave all the examples from mocking a disabled reporter to Charlottesville, how he's disappointed me. I try to give him a, a chance. I prayed for him and I'm done with him. And Joe Biden has won and he needs to concede. Well, this guy progressively got more, I guess what you could say is his, his comments towards me were hate filled. And I thought I was just there to offer some analysis and give my point of view as a lifelong conservative who supported Biden. This guy spends the final couple minutes of the segment saying that he doesn't think the Republican Party would want me back in, insulting my character, calling me out for being angry because I raised my voice and I got very worked up and passionate. But as you know, I've been here on this show with you for many years. I do not scream at anybody. I never call anybody names. This guy was trying to show an international audience, not just our fellow Americans, that my anger was unfounded and that I am uh, indicative of how the left operates and that it was it was crazy to me. He was painting me out as a unreal character. And it occurred to me then is that my passion is perceived as anger simply because I operate and act differently. My temperament's a bit different. The way I communicate is different. And therefore, he was painting me out a certain way. And I heard this over and over about Kamala Harris against Mike Pence in the VP debate, that she was too angry. She was too aggressive. She needed to stay in her lane because her behavior was not right. I think it's because black and brown women, we are not, again, looked at and perceived to be on the same plane as white women. There's a racism there. Thank you for hearing that story from me, by the way. Well, it was it, deeply painful. Well, it's there. Um, but the, but here's the deal, though. Identity politics is a reality because that's all politics. All politics, oh, is, sure. politics is broken down into groups. And so th- th- I don't care who you are. And so when you say so, uh, when you say soccer moms, they mean white suburban women. When you say NASCAR dads, th- we know what that means. And so that's all different categories. Uh, all right, folks, got to go to a break. We come, uh, we come back again. This is Veterans Day. Uh, also, we got some other stories to cover. We've got a historic, um, uh, a historic uh, appointment uh, when it comes to a black female uh, in the Navy. We'll talk about that story as well. Uh, and also on the show, uh, a um, new black uh, a black app uh, by Isaac Hayes the Third. We're gonna break that thing down. And of course, Donald Trump, the most laughable lawsuit, y'all. Uh, it gets even funnier by the day how they keep claiming voter fraud. Yet they, 
it can't seem to find any. You're watching Roller Martin Unfiltered. Back in a moment. We could get Lil Wayne, Drake, the Migos, Cardi B, Beyonce, Jay Z, Kanye. We got to get every person that they listening to to say something informational and positive about voting because it, they not listening to the average just vote. Let's, let, we gotta have to do some skits about why and what happens when you don't vote. It, it, you know, when you don't vote, then you have no community. You're like, hey, they changed Dowling Street to emancipation. I don't want that. Did you vote? Did you, because they asked, they asked, you know? You gotta get, you gotta hit people where they, where they stand at. Like, understand what you're not getting by not voting. Let me, let me give you a concept of, hey, you know you could have this, and this school could be better. It could have this in this school, but you know how you get that? By voting. But you don't wanna, you don't wanna vote. What you need me to do? You want me to put a, a food truck in front of every voting stand I'm handing out as you vote? Get you a hot plate as you as you walk off. You know, what do I need to do to get you to understand that this is, oh, I, do I need to get a bus and, and drive around and go to every elderly home and pick them up? Pick them up. Tell them we, we doing, it's bingo. You know what I'm saying? Pick, <laughs> pick them up. <laughs> they gonna get on that bus. They, they, they going to bingo? And we got free divers, too. <laughs> Raphael Warnack grew up in a house full of brothers and sisters. His parents taught him the value of hard work, like me. Like me, he was first in his family to graduate from college and went on to earn a PhD. He thinks insurance companies should not be allowed to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions, like me. Like me, Reverend Warnock knows that both parties in Washington could use some moral leadership. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I approve this message because it's time we had a senator who put Georgians first, like me. I'm John Ossoff, and too many are struggling to afford prescriptions. One change in the law would make a huge difference. See, Medicare is America's biggest buyer of prescriptions, but the drug companies bought off Congress, and they made it illegal for Medicare to negotiate lower prices. It's straight-up corruption. Fighting corruption is my job. I approve this message because I'm not taking donations from corporate PACs, and I won't let the drug companies rip us off anymore. First year I voted, I was 20, 1980, and me, with my radical mind itself, I voted for Angela Davis for President of the United States. <laughs> and uh, You wrote her in? I, I, wrote, her, I wrote her in, yeah. <laughs> and then it was Jimmy Carter versus... Right, Jimmy Carter versus Reagan. Versus Reagan. And then I realized that, okay, I, this is the World Series pimp game at the top. And I just realized the game of mathematics at the top. And then we got Ronald Wilson Reagan, which devastated our communities for an eight-year run. And then you had the four years of Bush. But it was the trickle-down factor that came out of that. That, I mean, it was, it was devastating in the area I came from. But I then knew that the, the voting, yes, the trick game was going on, but you better really seriously try to understand that like, like they used to play the numbers back in the day. You gotta figure out the numbers game. All right, folks, let's talk about that race in Georgia. The uh, deadline to register is December 7th. December 7th in that particular race. The runoff will take place on January 5th. It will pit, of course, Pastor Raphael Warnock against uh, uh, incumbent Senator Kelly Leffler. And then, of course, you have uh, John Ossoff, who's challenging incumbent Republican David Perdue. Now, here's the deal. Early voting, no, December 14th. Now, already, y'all, they starting to mess. Go to my iPad, Anthony. Uh, Kelly Leffler, she put out this tweet today. Uh, Reverend Warnock is a proud defender of Jeremiah Wright. Uh, he called police officers thugs and gangsters. He's anti-Israel, anti-Second Amendment, and sympathizes with Marxist too extreme for Georgia. Let me, first of all, you ought, to, you, ought to hear, you ought to hear this nonsense. Watch this, y'all. 
Meet Raphael Warnock. He wants you to know he eats pizza with a fork and a knife. He once stepped on a crack in the sidewalk. But Georgians don't care about that. Georgians care that Raphael Warnock was a proud defender of anti-American, anti-Semitic pastor Jeremiah Wright, who suggested America deserved the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Not God bless America, God damn America! We celebrate uh, Reverend Wright. Warnock said law enforcement officers are gangsters and thugs and a danger to children. He's anti-Israel, anti-Second Amendment, sympathizes with Marxists and socialists, and wants to make your neighborhoods less safe. Don't let him fool you with pizza and puppies. Raphael Warnock is too extreme for Georgia. Ooh, Robert. Ooh, Robert, the black guy is too extreme. Uh, he's too extreme for Georgia. This is the same Kelly Leffler uh, who trashed Black Lives Matter. Uh, where her own, uh, she owns the co owns WNBA team. Her own players basically told her to go to hell. Uh, how do you think that's going to play with black voters and white voters in Georgia? Well, I, I think that commercial, you know, that was written directly from the 2008 uh, anti Obama playbook. I think it was literally word for word uh, what a, a John McCain ad said back then uh, uh, with regards to Jeremiah Wright and Marxism and extremism. This is not going to work. <laughs> let's, let's understand that it was, if it was not a jungle primary um, on uh, November the 5th, President, uh, uh, Pastor Warnock, who's my pastor at Ebenezer, uh, would have won straight out. Uh, if it's, uh, in Georgia, the during the jungle primary, the names are listed in alphabet medical order, Warnock being at the end, even being at the end of a list of about 20 candidates, Warnock got the most votes of anybody in that uh, in that uh, jungle primary. So what we're going, um, uh, in addition to that, another benefit coming on January 5th is that the Secretary of State today announced that the other uh, statewide uh, statewide runoffs will also be on fe January the 5th instead of December the 1st. So that means my friend J uh, Daniel Blackman, who's running for Public Service Commissioner, will be on, J on January the 5th now, as well as the runoff between between uh, Howard Franklin and uh, and Kwanzaa Hall for the uninspired for the remainder of John Lewis's term. So by moving those to January the fifth, that means we're going to have enormous uh, turnout in Atlanta for both that congressional seat for John Lewis, which uh, which will have uh, former city council uh, men uh, Kwanzaa Hall uh, uh, campaigning for, as well as Howard Franklin and the P uh, public service commission race. Normally, in a runoff election, you get about ten percent voter turnout compared to the uh, to the general election, we're going to have several times that number because of the interest in this race, the amount of money that's going to be spent in this race, and there's a very good chance that Pastor Warnock will uh, win his race versus Leffler, who is a political neophyte, who has the issues with selling off stock and being in coronavirus, who said that she is the most pro-Trump senator that there is in order to beat Doug Collins in that crazy primary that they're running against each other in, um, and also who's um, been disowned by the WNBA and who has uh, ties to Wall Street because her husband owns the New York stock exchange. So Pastor Warnock has an outstanding chance where we have to push those turnout numbers on January the 5th. We have um, voter registration all the way up until December 7th. Early voting starts to December 14th. You have the opportunity to request your absentee ballot right now in Georgia. Uh, you have to get your absentee ballot application. Then they send you the ballot. Then you can send the um, ballot in. It's a three-part convoluted process. But, the, uh, but the, with, the, with that in place, if you have the same early voting numbers that we got for the general election, then more than likely Pastor Warnock will win, and by extension, John Ossoff will have the opportunity to win also. Um, and that is that this is one of the things that Stacey um, uh, Abrams put out here. She said, if you're a college student registered to vote uh, in Georgia, you can actually request your ballot uh, at ballotrequest.sos.ga.gov. You can also, uh, if you have any questions, call the Voter Protection Hotline at 888 730 5816. And so that's one of the things that she put out there as well. Uh, and uh, the, the thing that to me, that, that's interesting to me, um, uh, Scott, is, again, you, you, you're seeing, so Tom, Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, Senator Marco Rubio, they picked up on uh, what Kelly Leffler is putting out there. And I'm just sitting here saying, all right, I mean, y'all can try to use Reverend Wright and you could, I mean... <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out, Kelly Leffler, you're trying to say that a pastor at Ebenezer is anti-Israel. He probably can give you a lesson on the Bible. Exactly. And, and the, uh, and the, um, <laughs> the, the, the Quran and, 
uh, the, the, the other uh, the Torah. book. The, the, the Torah, forgive me. But, but, but wait a minute, guy. You know, Roland, I'm a little disappointed in your intro on this because it Karen Lugler, the one who's been endorsed by QAnon, and the QAnon, <laughs> and their racists and their call for violence, that the Congresswoman, I believe from Alabama or or Georgia, campaigned with Kelly Loeffler in order in you know, this race that is turned into a runoff. Is this the same Kelly Loeffler you're telling me about on top of the WNBA and her team rejecting her? We ain't talked about that. So the goal of her to to suggest that Jeremiah Wright, one of the greatest preachers of our time, or in history, if you will, regardless of whether you believe in what he's he preaches or doesn't. But but QAnon? Oh, and by the way, there are a lot of white people on the front lines with Black Lives Matter uh, uh, demanding and protesting the police who act like thugs, if you will, and criminals. Let's just call them what it is. They may not all be that. But I also think that if you tolerate that on your police force, you are just as liable. That's another discussion. But let's not forget the, quote, the QAnon or whatever you call it, that is this mythical conspiracy of deep state and racism and calls for violence against people. That's who she not only has embraced, but they've endorsed her as well, and she's campaigned with their representative. Enough said as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Rena, go ahead. And this is the same Kelly Loeffler that in March of this year was she and three uh, two other members of Congress and their advisors sold hundreds of thousands of dollars in stock after attending a closed door briefing about the coronavirus. That's the same <laughs> Kelly Loeffler. This woman. Yeah, I, I forgot about that. <laughs> I mean, oh, and 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 okay, no surprise. The Justice Department in May of this year closed the investigation into all three of those senators for those stock trades they made. Uh, you know, when the coronavirus was causing market turmoil. But these guys got the tip. So the fact that this woman is a U.S. senator just disgusts me. I mean, she's just ridiculous on every level, number one. Um, the imagery, I mean, I guess it re resonates with some people, but she is just so, she is so non-representative of the American woman. And so I actually, I'm not surprised that she, she got involved in insider trading like that because she's probably like, what? This is just business as usual. So anyways, uh, that's how I feel about Kelly Loeffler. <laughs> but we should look at the facts here. And in Georgia, it's it's not great facts, but but there's a silver lining. The Senate, election, Senate elections are usually likely to turn out more Republicans there, and that's based on past election data. Uh, now, we know, though, the African-American voter turnout in the general election was historically high in Georgia this year. And I think that's what's going to motivate African Americans again. We've got to be real about this. Georgia, whites in Georgia, more likely to be Republican. When they're affluent and white, they are more likely to be Republican and more likely to, to turn out for runoffs. We've got to combat that. I'm very proud of what happened in the general. I think Stacey Abrams deserves, man, medal upon medal, but the work is not finished. This has already felt like the endless election, and even though all of us agree and know that it's fact that Joe Biden has won, this was something I was a bit afraid of, is that the Trump campaign and his lawyers want to prolong this thing. So I, I don't know if uh, Scott can, can offer any input here as an attorney, but I, my sense is that this whole hand recount thing, which is really an audit, it doesn't matter, it's just verbiage uh, at this point, but, but I think Trump and his people think it could be to their benefit because it kind of puts off certifying electors. Could it lead us to a situation where Georgia legislature certifies electors in Trump's favor? Is that kind of the end game here? So I haven't had a chance really to investigate that today, and I apologize to the audience that I have not, but but I don't know if uh, Scott could shed any light on that. Well, anything's possible with this Republican Party. Let me say this. The second prong to any audit or recount has to do with, is it going to change the outcome of the election? Even if you had electors from Georgia who, who would come and then create an issue for the U.S. Senate to determine who to certify, the Trump electors or the state legislature electors, Georgia state legislature electors, or the Biden, uh, the winner of uh, Biden electors, if it doesn't make a difference or it doesn't change the outcome, 
Uh, that's the second prong of any test on these audits or these runoffs. So I still don't think so. They still have to put up or shut up. And so uh, the Georgia race, uh, going back to the Georgia race, let me just say this real quick. This higher turnout that we're going to have in this special election because of the money and how, what's at stake at the Senate, I think it helps also more than it would help, than it helps, ironically, uh, Warnock. Because Warnock and, and his race has all the celebrity and money and, and media attention, but also barely forced to run off. And now with this heightened scrutiny on it, right, I think he's going to be the surprise that he's going to be Senator Purdue. We'll have to see. But, um, Roland, what do you think about that theory? Well, um, eh, uh, I think really what you're dealing with here is that um, I the only way there's going to be a heightened... Uh, turnout is if the ground game is put into place. Typically, mm -hmm. there's a dramatic drop-off when it comes to runoff races. Uh, so what has to happen is there has to be this, this really focus. Republicans have already announced that they're going to send Mike Pence to Georgia. Personally, uh, I don't think uh, Donald Trump's ego uh, will allow him to sit in the White House. I think he is going to go to Georgia. I think, I think and you're already seeing this. I believe that uh, Fair Fight, Stacey Abrams' group, I believe uh, you're going to see Black Voters Matter. You're going to see Until Freedom. Uh, I know a number of groups who are already focused. Uh, I can tell folks, uh, you know, we are going to be uh, focused there as well. I mean, I'm literally sitting here uh, looking at uh, a house that our team can rent for the entire month for five weeks. Uh, we plan on having multiple crews. Uh, who are going to be uh, in Georgia as well. We want to be in those places, uh, such as uh, Albany. We want to be in Savannah. We want to certainly be in Atlanta. Uh, want to be in Fort Valley. We, we, you know, our plan is to go to those places where black voters are, uh, talk to them. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. So I, that's going to be intense focus. But this runoff is going to be... You, they could talk all day about money. They could talk all day about blanketing with TV ads and radio ads. This is all about ground game, Robert. And, and, if, well, and, and if you're the DCCC, if you're, I'm sorry, you're the D, DSCC, you're, you're the Democrats, this, it has to be about ground game, ground game, ground game. You have to look at the last election, you have to look at the runoff and say, what do I anticipate uh, there being a drop in terms of turnout? And then, uh, and then how can we get our people out? That's, that, that's how they're going to have to win this race. You're absolutely right, Roland. Back in 2010, I was the field director for Ken Hodges, who was the candidate for attorney general in Georgia. Uh, and we had a 159-county strategy where we had either a church or a supporter in every single county in the state of Georgia. We hit the ground hard, uh, while I think Roy Barnes was running for governor that year, hit the airwaves hard uh, with commercials. We got more votes from the third spot, uh, from the attorney general's uh, spot, than Roy Barnes got for governor, or that the person who was running for lieutenant governor got from the lieutenant governor's seat. Georgia is all about ground game and knowing where to go, when to go, and how to get there. Even in the deepest red Confederate flag, MAGA country part of Georgia, there are black families, black churches, um, um, uh, Hispanic uh, populations that can be reached out to and touched and that many people forget to, um, to get out of there. You cannot just campaign in Atlanta and think you're going to win an election in Georgia. Once you cross 285, you're in a completely different state. And if you do not understand that territory and how to campaign there, then you're not going to be able to win. And one of the problems that Democrats often have in Georgia in the South in general, they'll get a race like this that's close, where you have a runoff, where you have a chance to win. And, and instead of talking to <clears throat> Sorry, instead of talking to, you know, Fred Hicks or talking to uh, some of the political strategists who are from there, they'll bring in people from D.C. and New York and California to try to run a, uh, a a poll tested and focus group certified campaign. And those always lose. You have to hit that ground running. And it's important to have a message that's going to turn out your base. Runoffs are about turning your base out, not about persuading new voters. Right. So instead of trying to find that 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 one swing voter who used to who voted in the, in the 1984 election, election uh, for uh, Walter Mondale, seems you could bring him back to the Democratic Party, you need to be hitting these communities in Columbus and Albany, uh, Augusta, Macon, Statesboro, uh, Rome, Georgia, Carrollton, Athens, all around the state where you have minority populations that vote 90 percent for Democrat, and making sure you get them to the polls. Buses, churches sold to the poll, uh, early voting matters. And we, and we have those sorts of turnout numbers. That's how you win a race in the state of Georgia. Yeah. 
That's what, it, you know, what, what it's going to boil down to. Reina, what, how do you see Republicans uh, playing this race? Um, you know, uh, I mean, obviously, both sides know how critically important these two are. Democrats, excuse me, Republicans right now have a 49-48 advantage. They won the seat uh, in Alaska. If they win these, these two seats, they'll be 51-48. If they win one, 51-49. Democrats need both to force a tie with Senator Com with Vice President-elect Kamala Harris being the tiebreaker, which means they will control the chamber. And so how will Republicans uh, try to go after uh, these two seats? Well, I think it's going to be a <laughs> everything in the kitchen sink <laughs> sort of effort because the reality is is that Joe Biden is up 14,000 votes, right? And that's where we're at. That's truth. Uh, and that's in Georgia. So there's a lot of uh, disgruntlement right now amongst GOP operatives down there of sort of like, how do we get here? But I also know how we got there. I look at, uh, okay, well, let me let me be clear here. I have, I've looked at some exit polling. I don't really trust exit polling um, fully. And I think all of it needs to be taken with a grain of salt right now until we have complete totals everywhere. So I will say this. I think uh, obviously GOP operatives are fretting. Ossoff is a sort of known quantity. Warnock is not, politically speaking. Ossoff having run before but uh, I think uh, the wild card here, I think, is, is is Warnock. And I've already started to see on the right uh, the, the stories come up. And I was not aware, for example, that uh, Reverend Warnock and his wife are divorced and they'd had a domestic dispute as he was preparing for his Senate run. It, 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 uh, right. Well, no, that, that was an alleged domestic dispute. It was an actually It went nowhere. Okay. So yeah, she, she, alleged, that she alleged Even that he drove over her. She alleged he, he drove over her foot. That's right. It, it went nowhere. Oh, that's good to know. So, so but I, I mention it only because I was not aware of it previously. I saw the Atlanta Journal-Constitution covered it way back in March or whenever it happened earlier this year, and then they got divorced, what, a few months later. I, I didn't even know he was married or single, whatever, but I'm seeing this headline popping up again. And I know that the GOP has a problem with what? White suburban women who are around my age in, in their mid-30s, particularly because we have young children. We've gone to liberal colleges mainly. We've come back and lived in the suburbs of Georgia. This is... A reality is that this disinformation campaign or making Warnock seem out to be like a an angry guy who runs over somebody's foot just because, uh, it's coming out because they want to question sort of his fitness for office. And I think that's what they're trying to put in the minds of these younger white suburban women is like, hey, you might be good with Joe Biden because he reminds you of your very uh, sweet uncle who, you know, is from a nice era and very statesmanlike. And, and look, I've been so impressed by Joe Biden and how he's been handling this Donald Trump concession stuff. But, but are you, you know, what they're trying to, to sow doubt with, uh, which is rich of them, uh, is, is sort of, are you good with this, this black man who you don't know much and hasn't really been in the, in the light uh, that we all know much? He's been, you know, part of Ebenezer, but do you really know him? Do you know he was involved in this? So that's what I see kind of happening right now. And, and I think operatives are going to get really, really nasty in the next few weeks. So, so we all have to be really alert as to what is truth and, uh, yeah, what's fiction. Uh, look, well, the security in all this, though, is it, uh, Roland? Go ahead. I mean, it, it, there, are no, there are no character purity tests. Each of these four candidates have their either political or personal flaws. So what? I mean, Donald Trump's not going to be on the ballot down there. Uh, Loeffler and Warren are going to be on the ballot. And you want to compare characters. I'll take the minister's character over Karen uh, or Loeffler's any time if they want to get into that dirty kind of smacking match, if you will. Um, I don't know whether that's going to be a big issue. I understand the GOP strategy, but Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have got to get down to Georgia. The whole personality piece, it may be relevant, but it's not going to be dispositive because the Senate... And who controls the Senate is going to be on the ballot down there. And I think that's what's going to turn out or going to drive that turnout. This is a national race, even though it's in Georgia. And so we'll certainly have to see. Again, I say it's going to help also because of the national attention and the money going in there right now. But getting people to the polls, getting them to the polls on Election Day or before Election Day, if there's early voting, is going to be key. And whoever executes that the best are going to win these one or two races. Uh, look, I think that, uh, look, it's going to be an enormous amount of money. 
uh, when, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi spoke out about, you know, how the candidates run there in Georgia, I was like, you know what, uh, let, let the folks in Georgia figure it out. And then, and to your point, Robert, that is exactly it. Frankly, why consultants coming out of D.C. can't come into Georgia to say, hey, this is how you win Georgia? That's not going to do it. Hey, the, people in yeah, Georgia, the people in Georgia know best uh, in terms of if you look at Warnock and Ossoff, because I'm, I'm quite sure they are going through that and they're looking at the numbers. They're, they're looking at precincts. They're looking at who voted, who didn't. Somebody floated this story today that 95,000 people voted uh, for Biden, didn't vote for anybody else. I'm sure people are like, okay, where, you know, where are those votes? Because this is going to be a close, close race and margins are going to matter, which is why if black intensity, if black turnout intensity is at a high rate, that can very well offset what is happening other places. You're absolutely right, Roland. I cannot implore the party enough. A half billion dollars on both sides of the aisle is going to be spent in this race in the next 60 days uh, or so. So it's crucially important to hire black consultants on the ground, hire local consultants in your local region. Don't simply think you're going to hire a kid from Emory or somebody from Gwinnett County and send them down to Brunswick, Georgia to do door to door campaigning. It's not going to work. Work with the local organizations, put street money out there. Uh, the black church is alive and well as a motivator of people to vote in this uh, in this state. Make sure that you have somebody who can connect you with those ministries and get out there on the ground. Uh, do not sit up in Buckhead thinking you're campaigning to the state. Do not lose this race as we've seen happening so um, before. And don't try to bring out-of-state issues to Georgia and think you're going to campaign on them. I've seen um, where they'll bring something which is popular in California and think that you're going to win a district attorney race in, uh, in Telfair County with it. It simply put does not work. So the local touch is crucially important, and that ground game and that effort. Don't just run commercials on uh, cable on cable news and think you're going to win. You have to put money into black radio. Um, I don't care if it's a podcast or talking on somebody's iPhone who has 100,000 Instagram followers. You have to get out there and touch people where they are and make sure that you are beating the bushes to turn out your vote. Don't do this whole song and dance where you try to convert the Reagan Democrats back to the party. This is not the time for that. 10% of people who vote in general elections usually vote in runoffs. you got to get that closer to 15 or 20 percent on the Democratic side if you hope to win. And I think that one of the things that... One, well, I think one of the things they're also going to have to do is, and again, this is... Look, I, this is one of the hardest things, I think, for these campaigns uh, to, frankly, to understand black people. What often happens is they'll say, well, you know, we're, we're going to focus our money uh, just on the, uh, on the media outlets there in Georgia. Mm, we're a little bit different in that in that our people are communicating with our people in Georgia. We're communicating with HBCU students. And so when you support this show, when you support uh, syndicated black radio, you're also hitting those particular places because we are reaching out uh, to our folks there as well. And I think that's one of the things that uh, these campaigns don't quite understand about African-Americans in terms of the role that black media plays in terms of being able to drop information to, play, to places like that. You're absolutely right. And so if you're not advertising on black radio or black television, black media, if you're not working with all the organizations, you know, we have conference calls each week with uh, Rainbow Push, Urban League, NAACP, Fair Fight, um, NSA's group, uh, New Georgia Project. Uh, so many people who are organizing on the ground uh, and who are working to get these people out and who have been working on these things for years. You know, you don't have a blue Georgia without he Helen Butler. You don't have a blue Georgia without Rita Samuel. You don't have a blue Georgia uh, without Janice Mathis. Those those are people who have been beating the, uh, who have been fighting these fights long before people even knew there was a fight to jump into. And you have to support those those organizations. Uh, don't just go national, go granular, and make sure you're talking to people where they are. Those are the folks who are going to win this election for you. Uh, folks, um, we've been showing you all this drama. We showed you yesterday the Daily Show video uh, about just the hypocrisy of especially all you folks on Fox News. Uh, the folks at the Washington Post uh, put this mashup together. And if you want to see how nut, how just nuts all these people sound today compared to 2016. Watch this. There is absolutely no way to rig a national election. They are handled at the local level. So what's going to happen is they're going to have their recount. And then let's just hope they accept that Donald Trump was elected. The big question is uh, whether or not 
this is so widespread, and Brian, you used that word a moment ago, widespread to overturn an entire election. Hillary Clinton's campaign said it is supporting recount efforts that are led by Green Party candidate Jill Stein. Now, this is insanity. It's all about trying to undermine a Democratic election and, of course, Donald Trump's decisive victory. Now, of course, they have no actual proof of voter fraud or any wrongdoing. Democrats, they just want to try and block any and all audit of what are now growing examples and, frankly, affidavits of ballot irregularities and outright illegality. So the idea is that Russia somehow got into the software that runs the voting machines and manipulated the results. Is there any evidence that's true? I mean, I'm not saying, you know, right. like, I'm always open to evidence, but that seems insane to me, and we shouldn't I, suggest I, it unless we have actual evidence. At this stage, the fraud that we can confirm does not seem to be enough to alter the election results. We should be honest and tell you that. Of course, that could change. We don't know how many votes were stolen on Tuesday night. We don't know anything about the software that many say was rigged. We don't know. We ought to find out. If there's every election that doesn't need a recount, it is this one. What about the arrogance of people saying the president can't get a recount or can't look into the allegations? Somehow, Donald Trump was not the duly elected president of the United States. This is all a right. distraction. In closer, particularly contentious races, Democrats, more so than Republicans, seem to have a problem conceding defeat. I love these legal challenges because we have to get to the bottom of all this and, and expose fraud where it occurred. <laughs> oh, my God. Then, of course, you have Fox <laughs> News media guy Howard Kurtz. He's worried about the amount of anger we're seeing as a result of the election. He tweeted this from Trump's GSA barring Biden transition officials from federal buildings to Whoopi Goldberg telling his voters to suck it up. Both sides are playing the politics of payback. Why the anger still rages and the election feels Endless. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Rena. Has Howard actually watched his own network? <laughs> it's like <laughs> they all need a mirror. I mean, look at the Trump administration, how anti American it's being right now, and casting doubt, stirring conspiracy theories, and doubt upon the legitimacy of our free and fair election. And these are the most un American folks, and yet they want to try to point the finger. And they've been so hypocritical. I mean, everything they say is just so oxymoronic, everything that comes out of the mouth. I mean, whether you're looking at these, these anchors on Fox or, or anybody that works in the Trump administration right now, who, by the way, knows in their hearts of heart, heart of hearts that their job is over. Um, but look, I mean, I think Kurtz uh, brings up something that is, is so important, and we ought to talk about it, is that and, and look, you might not like this all the time, but what I have to say, but it's it's really that both sides have been inflaming, uh, fanning the flames for a long time. Now, I know that it's been the Republicans, particularly these past four years, because they have the Oval Office and that man has the bully pulpit and he has been just worse than I ever expected. But you do, you do see a lot of this division having been drummed up by both the parties. I think we're just in a moment where we need somebody mature. And that's why I'm so glad Biden's our president because he's going to continue to lead in maturity. He's going to encourage America to realign with its democratic norms and institutions. That is the one thing that I believe Donald Trump was extremely successful in these past four years, is breaking down the trust we have in our institutions, really eroding the pillars in places like our Department of Justice. And so what I love about Biden is that he, he speaks calmly to the strife. And he, he, I think he will be very much a huge part of what will be the civic renewal era, or can be. We don't know yet. I mean, it's going to start in January. He can be the beginning of our public officials, elected leaders, extinguishing the flames of this partisan bickering that is just... It is it's characterized how our politics has been for too many years. And these past five years have been exhausting in this way. I mean, I get it. It's an uphill battle. And and Biden has it in his own party. When he talks about unity, I mean, I, I, I think he's talking about that fight in his own party. But like I said, both sides are, are guilty of inflaming the rhetoric. And, uh, but, you know, the good news is we have Biden, who's remained a really measured tone regardless of everything. He showed that through the campaign in the primary that he wouldn't bow to the left's extremes. And he was also, you know, he's all about partnering and with all sides to build this really broad coalition of decency. We should feel encouraged. We should feel hope because we shouldn't listen to these pundits and, and a lot of people who want us, who, who really, frankly, they profit off of us being more divided. 
So here we are. I'm not trying to listen to none of these damn Fox people, Scott. I know they call you because you're safe, but... Um... <laughs> Why you attack me like that? I'm just messing. I'm just. I know. Matter of fact, matter of fact, I saw Robert on that too. They 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 they, 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 they like you. Safer than you. They thought. Oh, now you know damn well you safe compared to me. You you. Uh, you do the networks too. You you know. Hold hold up, boy. Now, now now Scott. Now come on. Now calm down. Now you know damn well. You know. I like your voluntary attack. You you know damn no, well I'm way unfair. I'm way too black and radical uh, for them compared to you now. Come I'm on. A radical. I just like nice things. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. But it's 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 amazing. It's amazing to listen to these fools. Just a complete reversal. A complete reversal. I mean, they will suck up to Trump on anything. And this is this is the fundamental problem with the Republican Party today. And, and that is, they will suck up to him, and then then don't even go, don't even flip to Newsmax and OANN. They even more crazy on those networks. Well, it's it's cult like, and it's rooted. No, 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 no not cult like. It is a cult, not cult like. A cult. It's a cult. Right. It's a matter of fact, they gonna be they pass the Kool Aid all day. Exactly, and they, and they go, they're gonna be politically dead after after they certify the results of this election, uh, which is a great ending for a political cult like this. But but let me be real clear on something. Um, they, they, listen, the Republicans have driven this narrative for the last four years. Tell me one thing the Obama administration over eight years did that was politically divisive or used politically divisive rhetoric. Uh, Rain, I just disagree with you. It's kind of hard, and, and it's, it's kind of hard to argue that both sides are guilty of it when you look at what the Republicans the last four years have done to this country, the support of the president, attack on our institutions, the racism, the xenophobia, the sexism. I find the Democrats in a reactive mode. They didn't control all three houses like the Republicans did. They didn't attack Obamacare simply because it was Obamacare, if you will. And so I think we have to be careful when we talk about, you know, uh, the, the attacks coming from both sides, because I just don't believe that at all. You have the Merrick Garland issue. You have the Charlottesville issue. I mean, I can give you 10 or 15 issues where the Republicans were just dead wrong about this, and the Democrats were fighting for human decency. And now Biden comes along, and now everybody in the media... And everybody on the Republican side, and even some Dems, want him to be the great unifier, if you will. Even Obama, when he inherited a, a depression-like economy uh, from the Bush administration, was criticized by the Republicans for not fixing it fast enough. So I just reject that. I understand Biden's got to do what he's got to do, but I got to tell you, I'm a little sick and tired of the, the Democrats having to be the grown-ups in the room and, and withstand the Republican but, but attack that destroyed but, the country. But, but it's just not fake. But, Robert, I don't think that's... First of all, that's not why Biden is doing that. Uh, the, the reality is, if you look at the polling data there, uh, Biden pulled a percentage of Republican voters. He pulled those independent voters as well. And that's really who he's playing to. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is, he can't... He can't first of all, look, even in Atlanta and Detroit, excuse me, in Philadelphia and Detroit, that was a decrease in terms of, in terms, in terms of, um, in ter in terms of black turnout. They're still studying the exit poll numbers. And so he got mm -hmm. the overwhelming numbers there, but you still had this drop. So, so the reality is he, ha he, is he ran differently and he has to govern differently because Democrats don't have 235 seats in the House and 55 seats in the Senate. You're absolutely right. Now, let's understand what President Trump is doing right now. Uh, this election is not over and it's not going to be over uh, until January of 2025, because what what every <laughs> indication is is that President Trump is running again in 2024. He's going to be launching his media network. Uh, they're going to be poaching off a lot of that talent that got thrown off of Fox for being too radical. So you'll see the Diamond and Silk show. You'll see uh, Bill O'Reilly will probably have a show. Trish Regan will probably have a show. Uh, and they'll build the Trump network out with um, some of the 
talent from the Blaze and from OAN, and they're going to be running a Vichy government in the shadows on uh, trying to undermine and control the narrative against Joe Biden um, and campaign to those 71 million people that supported and voted for President Trump and the probably 100 million others who did not turn out for him or were unable to vote for him. So this election is not over. So because of that, Joe Biden has to be cognizant of the fact that this entire four years is going to be the campaign. It's going to be the election. Just as Howard Kurt said, this is the eternal he, campaign. It does not well, end. It continues. It's like he, and, 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 but, but, but here's the deal, though. But here's the deal, though. Folk, folks must... Now, hold on, Scott. Now. Scott, here's the deal. Folks must be prepared. For, folks must be prepared for this. Donald Trump is going to be leading the opposition. Dude ain't going anywhere. Let's be real clear. He's not going anywhere. He cannot, he cannot tolerate uh, being ignored. I'm telling you right now, Republicans better get used to it. He is going to be leading the opposition, and you're going to hear his crazy uh, for a very long time, folks. It's going to happen. Let me also give you this news right here. I'll go to my iPad. Uh, Lauren Underwood, uh, in a district with very few African Americans in Illinois, uh, she actually has taken the lead. Uh, this is a tweet from Dave Wasserman. Um, he says, New Illinois 14th Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, African American. She leads, uh, her lead rises to 4,288 votes versus Jim Oberweis, uh, the millionaire. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it's also out of recount territory. So that's one of those seats Democrats uh, were looking to take back. I do want to go ahead and talk about this here. I, I, I'm, I, I'm getting, let me just, I'm really getting sick and tired of these damn progressives who are acting a complete ass. They're acting right now a complete ass, okay? Sniping at each other, blaming each other. Last I checked, the Democrats won the White House. Last I checked, they still control the House. Last I checked, if you win two Senate seats, you control the Senate. They're acting like they lost. And, and I think one of the biggest problems here is that these progressives and these Democrats, they thought there was going to be a blowout. They thought, oh, we're going to have 57 seats in the Senate. Man, we're going to go to 235, 40 in the House. Oh, my God. We're going to sit here and get 400 electoral college votes. It didn't happen. I wish they would shut the hell up. Stop going at each other and focus on Georgia, then focus on leading after uh, January. But this whole deal, oh, defund the police is why we lost. Oh, you didn't run. Uh, th that's what they're, they're saying over to AOC. And she's saying y'all didn't run strong digital campaigns. I'm like, Democrat, do you know how to enjoy a win? <laughs> They can't help themselves, Rowan. But I wish they would shut the hell up. Because what you're <laughs> well, doing is you're taking the emphasis off of where it should be, which is win those two Georgia seats. Focus. I got this. I mean, I saw this dumbass tweet today. And yes, I said a dumbass tweet. He blocked me. Somebody screenshotted this. Uh, and let, let me find it. Uh, this this just dumbass tweet from Sean King, same thing. Okay, uh, let me find this so I can uh, uh, so I can show it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pull up in a second, but it's just stupid. It's just it's like they're spending time on stupid stuff, and I'm like, you know what? Th 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 this is this is how you snatch. Uh, let me show you this right. So again, Sean King blocked me because I had the audacity. To, to lightly criticize him because he can't take criticism when he was when he was wrong going after Rachel Maddow in the primary over something she said about Bernie Sanders. God forgive, forbid you criticize Bernie Sanders. This is a stupid tweet Sean King sent out. And I'm calling it stupid. This is what he's tweeted. I live in uh, Hakeem Jeffries' district. Uh, drop the lower third. I live in Hakeem Jeffries' district in Brooklyn. I know at least five people that I think could challenge and defeat him. He's severely out of touch with his own constituents. He's also as weirdly obsessed with AOC as most Republicans. Disturbing. No, Sean. Disturbing is you tweeting this when the election, the next election for Hakeem Jeffrey is two damn years away. 
okay? Maybe the problem is you're obsessed with bullshit, okay? Because the real focus right now is not on somebody running against Hakeem Jeffries. The real thing is, can you beat Purdue and Leffler? This is stupid, Robert. It's stupid. Well, you're, you're completely correct. And Sean King wants to be doing something. Uh, you know, he should be in Atlanta for the next month or so, just like you. Uh, you're going to be just like Barbara Arnwine is going to be, C.K. Hoffler, uh, Ty Gary. Many of the people who are actually organizing folks to vote need to be down here. Uh, go uh, go to the AEC. You have uh, millions of social media followers. We rallying those people to vote, both get their absentee ballots and get them turned in. Forget about getting them to the polls on the 5th. Get them to vote right now. You can ha uh, hand out documentation. You can send them to the website. So you can send out the social media information to get those votes um, banked. If you want a pro progressive agenda, you're going to have to have progressive people in office. And even if somebody is not as progressive as you, they're still going to be more progressive than David Perdue. Uh, so the, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think a lot, a lot of this comes from um, uh, these folks are young. They haven't experienced the awfulness of life yet. They don't understand you're going to be disappointed more times than, uh, than not. And all you can really hope for is to get the best out of it that you can. And the, if you're going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, you're going to end up with Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell uh, and Michelle Bachman in the House of Representatives. And then we'll be going back to the draconian po um, policies that you just were trying to change. So let's work together for a little while. One thing that Republicans have been able to do, and um, part of the reason they are able to maintain political hegemony from the minority uh, minority demographic position, is because Donald Trump can say that uh, Ted Cruz's wife is ugly and that his dad killed Kennedy, and they still work together. He, Lindsey Graham can say that Donald Trump is a con man and he'd rather drink bleach than have to vote for him, and then work together on those uh, uh, for four years. We have to figure out how to be adults and, and not let these petty internal squabbles negate the public policy games are trying to make. This is why, this is why I think Sean tweeted this. He got all this back and forth on social media. Go to my iPad. Uh, this is the political story. They quoted Hakeem Jeffries on this call they had last week where Democrats were blaming each other back and forth. Do we want to win? Do we want to govern? Or do we want to be in internet celebrities? Uh, and so what they're doing is they're like, oh, he's taking a shot at AOC. He, here's the deal, and I have said this repeatedly and I don't understand, Rena, why people don't get this. And that is this. The Democratic tent is far larger and more ideologically diverse than the Republican tent. On the Republicans, you're either right, far right, or nuts. It's three. Right, far right, or nuts, okay? On the Democratic side, there are conservative Democrats. There are yeah. moderate Democrats. There are center-left Democrats. There are progressives. There are far-left. Then you got far, far-left folks that are so left, they might swing back right. Okay? That's what you got. And the reality is this here. Democrats, Republicans control 31 state legislatures, Wake up, which yeah. means they are in control of drawing the boundaries for congressional seats, which means that you have more hard right districts than you have hard left districts. In where? Texas, Florida, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and on and on. And so, when people say we can't run on defund the police, that's true depending on your district. You can't run on I'm a socialist depending on your district. You can't run on, uh, hey, I support fracking depending on your district. So what Democrats have to do is shut the hell up and allow, which we've been saying, allow people to run a certain way in their district 
and understand, Rena, that Republicans are going to run ads against that person saying they're going to be a puppet of Nancy Schumer. This is what they're going to do. I'm looking at political right now. This is on their front page. The GOP's Georgia boogeyman, Chuck Schumer. This is going to happen. But what Democrats need to do is stop all this back and forth bickering that plays out in media and shut up and say, you lost some races, you thought you were going to win some, but you still won, Rena. Now your focus has to be on Georgia and then reclaiming seats in 2022 when the map is actually set up better for Democrats than it is Republicans. That's right. It's about a num it's the numbers here. And I, I really love what Robert had to say, too, is that there's a bit of uh, the age thing playing in here, no doubt. I mean, this is a sort of eagerness to go ahead and, and make sure that Nancy Pelosi and Schumer go to retirement quicker than they expected. I mean, look, people, young people like AOC probably feel like, what the heck? Why are these guys still around? You know, here I am, pretty much an international celebrity, the, the figurehead of a movement, uh, she and the squad. But I mean, I think there, there's a reality here is that there's a long game to be played and they should be celebrating this as a win. I mean, there's no doubt on, um, in my mind, that that broad coalition building I spoke about and, and praised Joe Biden for is what got Joe Biden to where he it, he did. And he's, you know, he's getting very close to closing in on the same number that Trump did in 2016. So, you know, if Democrats nationally, uh, you know, and in these federal seats want to be smart and play this the right way, they need to do exactly what you said. They need to keep their mouth shut and stop blaming people like the Lincoln Project. When I saw AOC's tweet, I lost so much respect for her. I actually had started to come to, to feel like she was really coming into her own and, and was becoming Becoming very strategic herself, uh, but I think she she's lost sight here of the really big picture. And if this kind of behavior continues, they're digging their own grave. So I mean, let's acknowledge the facts for sure. Is that the GOP is not dead? This was a referendum on the man in the Oval Office, but not exactly on those Republicans holding seats all the way down ballot. You look around, you see the Republicans held on in the Senate so far, and it, I mean, they didn't get the flips they wanted. The Democrats did not get the flips they wanted in the House. But the reality is, you look at Republicans in the state houses, there were gains made. You look at the number of Republican women that were elected, it's a bigger number than ever. So I think that the country really, the Democrats throughout the country need to acknowledge this. And, and I know a lot have, but but it needs to really permeate and make its way through the ranks of, of those who've come up like AOC types. And, and I'm certainly not talking about Lauren Underwood types. I mean, I think Congresswoman Underwood, I'm just so glad, by the way, to see that lead she's got. She's been measured. She's been really good. Uh, but there are a number of others, like Rashida Tayyip. You know, they, they really ought to just close their mouths because they're still, uh, it shows the results of this election, what we know so far is that conservative policies are still pretty much in favor throughout the country. People don't want the tax hikes that could stop the growth of the economy, uh, whether it's post-COVID or right now in COVID. Uh, but, but, you know, there's also not vast support for Green New Deal, for things like, you know, cutting oil and, and, and gas and, uh, and coal. There's just not widespread support for that. And so this needs to go back to a moment where I think uh, younger Democrats, those who are very progressive, Aggressive and are trying to hijack, say to themselves, what kind of game is the other side playing? The other side is trying to paint us out as very fractured while they all get in line behind dear leader and whoever the next appointed dear leader would be. Oh, Scott. Yeah. Um, my mother used to say, just because you got an opinion doesn't mean you got to share it. Everybody in the room doesn't even know how you feel about something or somebody. And I understand the media and politics and stuff. But you know, it's a big picture. And you know, you're right. They ought to be focused on the Senate. You can have those conversations privately. Why does Sean King and AOC and others have to have these public discussions that are hurting the big picture for the Democrats, whether they're young or old? It doesn't well, well, really now, matter. First of all, here's what happened. Now, first of all, there was a call last week among the Democratic caucus. That call, it, stuff got leaked out. It got reported on. And there were comments mm -hmm. made. She also was interviewed in the New York Times. Look, stories are going to be done. The point, the point, right. I, the point I'm making is, uh, here's the deal. Uh, do, do I believe that uh, AOC is an internet celebrity? No. What she is is a very popular. Uh, there are a lot of people who love her across the country, but there are a lot of people who don't. And the reality is, 
she appeals to those people who she appeals to. Got it. But folks need to understand that that's not how every district is run. Just like you can't run like Maxine Waters in every district. You can't run like Jim Clyburn in every district. You can't run like that. Everything is based upon how your district is set up. And you have to take care of your district, right? You got to take, you got to. Yep, the 700,000 folks in your district. But take care of your district. You know, and there's some people people being called on the carpet. Scott, go ahead. Scott, go ahead. Can I I finish this point? Man, I said go ahead. Stop whining. Go ahead. (laughs) Your ass be interrupting everybody else, and now you're getting all sensitive. Now go ahead and finish. I'm not sensitive. C- come on, Kappa. Come on, Kappa. But anyway, you you take a you take a representative district like Lucy McBag, a conservative suburban uh, district of Atlanta, right? She ran against Handel. She handily beat Handel's because she focused on her district. She didn't. While the Republicans tried to get to paint her the way they were going to paint her, right? She spent a lot of time nurturing her district because she was in a much closer race two years earlier, right? That is a model race that she ran and that the Democrats needed to hold onto that seat, and she beat her by at least 10 or 20 percentage points, right? It encapsulates what you're saying in regard to each district being different. And if you take care of your district, then you can. the Democrats can have all of these different groups within the big tent, right? But they've got to be free to take care of their districts to maintain their electability. Yeah. That's what I... Again, all the back and forth helps nobody. At the end of the day, uh, it is about winning. It's about winning. And yet, Democrats, guess what? You won. Okay? Shut up. Celebrate the fact that you're in control. And now your focus should be in the next cycle, how to build upon that. That's what you do. But you don't sit here and you keep the back and forth and the whining uh, and the complaining. uh, That that helps nobody. It helps nobody. And it just makes no sense uh, whatsoever. All right, folks, uh, let's talk about this uh, good news right here uh, of a sister who's in the military. Midshipman First Class Sydney Barber will become the first black woman to assume the top role leading fellow students at the U.S. Naval Academy next semester as brigade commander. There's the highest leadership position within the student body. The semester-long position is selected through an application and interview process by senior leadership and the com- and commandant staff. Barbara is from Lake Forest, Illinois, and a mechanical engineering major. Her career goal is to commission be commissioned as a Marine Corps ground officer. So certainly congratulations uh, go out to her. And so, folks, uh, uh, real good there. One of the things that we also looked at on this Veterans Day is uh, exactly, first of all, the happy uh, Veterans Day to all uh, uh, former and current members of our military. We certainly appreciate your service. Uh, a poll by the Military Times in August showed a continued decline in active duty service members' views of Donald Trump and a slight but significant preference for President-elect Joe Biden. Trump's attack on mail-in ballots made a lot of military members angry. They even are fighting, fighting their ballots being counted right now. Uh, and so, but also, uh, I, and this is real quick, real quick conversation here. I'm going to start with Rena. We'll go Rena, Robert, then Scott. Uh, Rena, those comments by General, General John Kelly, I also think, I talked to some folks who in the military said that he didn't come out publicly, but he never denied those comments, that those comments reverberated through the military, and it's no shock to see how well Joe Biden did with military voters. You know, look, uh, Trump's reckless uh, tweets casting doubt on military votes that were lost, I mean, that just continues to show blatant disrespect for our nation, just blatant. I mean, his claims about being so pro-military, Trump claims to be so pro-military, that's opposed. He's clearly disenfranchising military members' votes. So when you look at this thing and I look at Trump, I know military members have woken up. I know their families have woken up and said, what the, what the heck is this? Disenfranchising military voters is so disgustingly un-American and, and is a huge disservice to those of us who've, who've worked to sustain our system. I mean, that's it. That's what it all comes down to. I mean, these men and women, we are the land of the free because we are the home of the brave. And Donald Trump is not for them. I mean, he's just an un-American man doing, doing what he's doing, casting down on their votes. Robert. 
Uh, and first, happy Veterans Day to my sister, my brother-in-law, my other brother-in-law. Uh, I come from a family that's well steeped in the military, and we do, will not have the freedoms that we have without their service. And I think it's important to remember that part of the reason that we saw uh, the results in this election are Donald Trump uh, attacking Gold Star families, his attacks on John McCain, saying, I prefer people who did not get <laughs> captured, uh, calling uh, military casualties uh, uh, losers and suckers. Uh, but he brags about increasing funds funding for the military, but does not mention the reason the military funding was cut under the Obama administration was because of the austerity measures forced by the House of Representatives under Cantor and Boehner in order to have the debt ceiling compromised. So the Republicans cut funding to the military, or forced funding cuts to the military for the sequester, and then Donald Trump brags about them getting power and increasing that same uh, same funding without finding a, a revenue source to offset it, which has increased the deficit, which Republicans theoretically were against the entire time. So the fact that we are seeing this rampant hypocrisy, this lack of respect for the military, is going to be a sea change going forward because what Democrats have been arguing for for decades is that the best way to respect our military is by, by, by having a humble foreign policy that does not put them in harm's way in foreign theaters for no clear goal and no, no clear reason. And the best way to respect our servicemen, uh, men and women, is to keep them safe and at home and not entangled in foreign wars of convenience for treasure and not for the national security of the United States of America. Scott? Yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues. I can't think of one reason why a commander-in-chief of the United States military would ever attack them and then give them money, but attack them. There's really no basis for it whatsoever. And so if military, when you attack the military votes and you need those military votes, right, you need them to win and then you attack them. It makes no sense. It's just more, more stupidity on the part of a Donald Trump. All right, Scott. Uh, Robert and Rena, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Coming up next, folks, our Tech Talk segment with the son of Isaac Hayes. He has uh, a new app uh, that uh, you might be very interested in that we'll discuss next. Roll about unfiltered. So not only do I have to figure out what these candidates stand for and what they're talking about when they're giving all these speeches and, and literally every other word, I might have to look up in the dictionary just to figure out where their viewpoints are. I have to also figure out, okay, I have to look at my history. Am I allowed to, am I allowed to vote? Is there, you know, is, it, it, will I be arrested sitting in federal prison because I cast this ballot? Then there's, well, what county am I in? And, and, and mm -hmm. where do I go now to vote? And then it's, okay, there are all these other, you know, all these different categories of people to vote for. It's not just the president of the United States. Right. It's just, you know, you've got your governors, and you've got your senate, you've got your, your statesmen, like all these different things that you have to, you know, and then, all of those, um, all their platforms are not, they're not laid out there. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to go and you kind of no, have to you like put the work in. Yeah. Nineteen eighty-two, a twelve-year-old is accused of stealing and dragged out of store, told he looks suspicious because his hands are in his pockets. I'm Raphael Warnock, and that boy was me. Back then, I didn't understand how much the system works against those without power and money, that the rules were different for some of us. Too often, that's still true today, especially in Washington. I approve this message because it's time for that to change. I'm John Ossoff, and the path to recovery is clear. First, we listen to medical experts to control this virus. Then we shore up our economy with stronger support for small businesses, and tax relief for working families. And it's time for a historic infrastructure plan to get people back to work and invest in our future. We need leaders who bring us together to get this done. And that's why I approve this message. Too often we will look at others and make a judgment on what they should, shouldn't do. I think we all have to operate based on our convictions, right? And that conviction, especially when it comes to being politically active, is going to take a different shape in each individual relative to who they are, their platform, their background, so on and so forth. But I agree with you that we all, especially in this moment that we're living in, should feel compelled, no matter what our sphere of influence is, is to do something to help make this thing different.
All right, Isaac Hayes III, executor of his father's estate and tech founder, is raising money for a new app. Folks, uh, let's talk about exactly what that app is. Isaac, what's going on, man? This is, what is Fanbase? Fanbase is a social network that allows people to monetize their content, finally, every single person. All right, so when you say monetize uh, that content, and so obviously right now there are folks who are on Instagram, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, and they're posting stuff, and they're getting uh, lots of views, but they ain't making no money. Right, they're not, and that's an enormous problem because we're all content creators, and there's really no monetization. There's a lot of uh, content that people put enormous amounts of effort in and don't see return on anything that they do. They, they shoot skits, they do dances, they're doing makeup, tutorials, all kinds of stuff, but there's really no money being made. So I wanted to provide a solution for everybody to monetize their content and actually have subscribers and followers at the same time. So, so how does it actually work? How does the monetization work? Are folks paying a subscription fee? I mean, how, how, I mean just explain exactly what fan base is. Yeah, um, so fan base allows you to have followers and subscribers. You can follow all your friends, but if you're a real big fan of uh, uh, 21 Savage, you can subscribe to 21 Savage and his exclusive content, and you have that same subscription power too. So you can post content where people can subscribe to you. So I've monetized everything from photos to videos to long form content up to one hour, like your your own Netflix or even going live. And so um, you can have subscribers and you can love content on my platform. And when you love a piece of content, you give the content creator half a penny. You can like for free, but you can also love content and say, hey, let me tip you half a penny or two and you can love a post as much as you want, even in the live feed. So you can make money going live that way. So, to, so like on that point, when people go live on Instagram right now, it's just, and then they give out their cash app and people, you know, they can give that way, but there's really no other way for you right. to monetize a live stream. Yeah, I mean, there, there are other solutions that people are trying to come up with, but I feel like uh, giving the user an enormous audience um, without having algorithms that slow your engagement down, I think you and I both know and on some of these platforms, they throttle down your engagement because they want you to pay for ads to access your audience. I want to do the opposite. I want to give you your entire audience so that the more people that have eyes on you, the more people you convert into subscribers and actually earn revenue. So I'm going the opposite direction. I want you to have your entire audience. Uh, and so, uh, and so, and so let's talk. Let's talk about that. Uh, you know. You, you, you put this together because your experience uh, has been just a, a little bit differently, frankly, than, than some other folks. Because, uh, you know, what 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 was it that, that what what was it that you saw where you said, you know what? I mean, it's great having all these followers, but I'm sorry, I'm just I'm just feeding the beast of Instagram and Facebook. Well, there's this young kid um, about two years ago that goes by the name of Ghetto Spider. He's from Memphis, Tennessee. He went viral doing a dance inside a GameStop um, in a Spider-Man costume, dancing the aha take on me. And me being born in Memphis, I just reached out and just said, wow, like you went viral from the hometown, congratulations. And the first thing that he asked me was, was I a manager? And I probably said, well, I manage some artists in my dad's estate, but you know, what's up? He goes, I really need a manager. And so I thought about it and, and I said, well, let's get in contact, we exchange phone numbers. And I never really reached back because I was thinking, this kid has all this talent, but he can't monetize Spider-Man because Marvel owns Spider-Man, but he has this enormous amount of talent and he's having this great viral moment. What can he do? And I said, he needs to be able to get paid for his content, his talent. And so that really gave me the idea to build the platform. So we're on your, uh, so, so you're, you're, you're going through uh, the raise right now. This is a video. This is your Instagram page yes, right here. Uh, and you've raised $150,000 uh, for the app. What is your what is your goal? Uh, how much you're trying to raise? Uh, and uh, just explain that. And, and where and if people are interested, where can they go? So what I'm taking advantage of is uh, uh, Barack Obama and Joe Biden passed some legislation in 2012 called the Jobs Act. And so I need to explain what the JOBS Act is. The JOBS Act allows anybody to invest in a seed stage company. So before 2012, 
from 1933 all the way up to 2012 for 85 years, the only way you can invest in a private company in the seed stage was to be an accredited investor. So that means you had to have a net worth of a million dollars minus your primary residence or make over $200,000 a year for two consecutive years. How many people do we know that have that? Absolutely not. So it doesn't matter if you're white, if you're black, it was about being wealthy. So only wealthy people had the opportunity to invest in these early companies. So moving to the tech era with the Instagrams, the Facebooks, the TikToks, the Twitches, all these companies that came about, you never got a phone call to invest in a seed stage um, um, round of a company. So the Jobs Act lowered those regulations and allows anyone to invest in a seed stage company um, regardless of how much money they make or their net worth. And so I took advantage of that on this platform called Start Engine. And so right now I'm raising a million dollars on Start Engine. We launched a campaign um, last uh, Friday. Yeah, the last Friday, I think, no, sorry, the Friday before last. So we're almost 11 days in and I've raised $150,000 in crowdfunding from um, the general public and people that decided that they wanted to invest. And so we're doing extremely well. Um, the raise is on startengine.com slash fan base. The minimum to invest is $256. So anybody can own part of this company, this platform as we grow. We've had a lot of traction. Um, we're moving at a, a, a very fast pace. But again, remember, like seed stage companies go on to make an enormous <laughs> amount of revenue if they have a liquidity event like an exit or an IPO or a merger. So that's one of the most important things that I encourage everybody uh, to go check out um, fan base on startengine.com. And so that's really what I want people to do because we can't really miss this moment. To think about this, that um, number one, Orrin Michaels was a seed investor in Uber. And he raised, Orrin Michaels was a seed investor in Uber, and he put uh, $4,000, $5,000 into Uber in the seed round, and nine years later, that's worth $24 million. So think about that. That's an incredible amount of money in a seed stage. So everybody has an opportunity to invest. I want to turn hundreds of black people into millionaires that have an opportunity to invest in a tech culture and a tech app because our culture drives these social networks, right? We take our dances to TikTok. We take our humor and wit to Twitter. We take our talent and our, and our content to Instagram and nobody's getting paid. And so I wanted to build a platform and enter the space as a black founder alongside other the, all these other tech platforms, but give us the opportunity to not only own our culture, but monetize it as well. All right, then. Well, again, folks, they can actually go to uh, startengine.com forward slash fan base uh, where they can check it out. Uh, go to my iPad, please, and you see it right here. Uh, it lays out all the information there. Uh, you got the lower third, please. Absolutely. It lays out all the information there. Uh, and again, this is, folks, if you choose to invest, look, there, there are rules there. Uh, that's It's all based upon, it lays it out there, uh, what, what the requirements are, all those different things along those lines. And so check it out. Uh, read all the information if you're interested. Uh, take a look at that. But uh, Isaac, certainly congratulations with that. Uh, and uh, we'll be uh, seeing you uh, on your way trying to raise that million bucks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Folks, that is it. That, that is it for us. If you want to support Roland Martin Unfiltered, please do so by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support this show. So simply, uh, you can contribute by going to Cash App, dollar sign RM Unfiltered, PayPal.me forward slash R Martin Unfiltered, Venmo.com forward slash RM Unfiltered. Uh, you can also send a money order to New Vision Media Inc., 1625 K Street Northwest, uh, Suite 400, Washington, D.C., 2006. That's it for me, folks. I will see you tomorrow right here on Roller Martin Unfiltered. I got to go.